Okay, good evening, everybody. Um, I, it's my pleasure to welcome you um, to the Gene Sanford Distinguished, uh, Pro Distinguished Professorship Lecture. Um, my name is David Rondell. I'm the Interim Director uh, of the Core Humanities Program in the College of Liberal Arts um, here at UNR. Um, I, um, it's my pleasure uh, to introduce uh, Jason Ludden, who is our um, Distinguished Gene Stanford uh, Professor, and he'll be giving um, uh, his lecture tonight. Um, perhaps before we begin, I'll uh, let you know about a few uh, of the ground rules, just kind of sketch how, how the evening will unfold. Um, so I'll, um, in just a moment from now, uh, introduce Professor Ludden, um, tell you a little bit about him. Um, I'll turn over uh, the presentation to him. He'll give us his talk uh, that I'm very interested um, uh, to hear. Um, after which point uh, we'll open things up to, Q, uh, to a Q&A. Um, there'll be a chance for audience uh, to um, ask their, have their questions answered. So please do, uh, as the talk is unfolding, please do feel free to uh, put any questions that you might have into the Q&A um, and we'll be able to um, address those uh, when the talk is, um, uh, when Jason has done his talk. Um, and so perhaps uh, that maybe those are the only ground rules uh, that I have to share. And so uh, with that, perhaps I'll, I'll now introduce um, Professor uh, Jason Ludden. Well, actually, perhaps maybe before I do that, I do want to, on behalf of the Core Humanities Program at uh, UNR, I do want to express uh, our thanks and acknowledge um, the Sanford Endowment, which makes this uh, distinguished professorship possible, um, and also to acknowledge the National Endowment for the Humanities, um, whose funding has also been instrumental um, in the creation of this distinguished professorship. Uh, very well then, without further ado, uh, let me introduce you all um, to Professor Jason Ludden. Um, Dr. Ludden is, as I mentioned a moment ago, the current Gene Sanford Distinguished Professor um, in the Humanities. Um, he's taught in our core humanities program, um, particularly our CH202 and 203 um, for many years. Um, additionally, um, he wears many other hats um, in, uh, in the UNR community. Um, he's a teaching assistant professor in the English department. He's also the director for the Office of Undergraduate Fellowships in the Honors College, um, and also an educator fellow for the International Environmental Communication Association. So he arrived at UNR uh, over a decade ago, um, having completed his MFA in creative writing at Oregon State University, Go Beavers. Um, and then joined the English department uh, here at UNR as a faculty member after completing his PhD. Um, his research focuses on the rhetoric of science um, and environmental communication, um, specifically examining how concepts like forest health, riparian zones, and animal corridors are constructed um, and discussed. Uh, this has led him uh, most recently to collaborate with colleagues in the Department of Geography uh, and the College of Agriculture, Biotechnology, and Natural Resources uh, to examine how human-elephant conflict is researched and discussed in rural communities um, in Sri Lanka. Um, and so the subject of his talk, um, as you probably were able to glean um, from the title itself, um, relates to this very project. Um, and so perhaps then without any further ado, um, I'll turn things over to uh, Professor Ludden um, and so we can hear um, his lecture tonight. Um. Thank you so much for that introduction. Uh, that, that was great. And thank you all so much for uh, coming here today um, and taking a little bit of time out of what I know is a busy semester or lives to talk about the Anthropocene and elephants in Sri Lanka. Um, so I have some slides here that I'm gonna share as kind of a general guide to the talk. And here we get going. So, um, the talk is really going to be about elephants, uh, and elephants talk about the Anthropocene. I like the idea of putting these two ideas, one being a very material animal that's alive on this planet, uh, and that materiality is interesting to me, um, and the Anthropocene, this idea uh, that we're now living in a time where humans are controlling the environment to such an extent that we are everywhere all the time forever. But I'm getting ahead of myself. First, uh, I would like to thank the Core Humanities Department and especially uh, the Gene Sanford Center for Aging and their support uh, in my professorship and the research I've been working on. Um, there have been many people who've come before me and this is always uh, 
a great opportunity for faculty to really dive in and do research and then think about how their research relates to aging and how aging is constructed and discussed in a larger culture. Um, I also need to thank some other people who have supported this. Uh, one is the National Science Foundation, which I'm going to get back to. Uh, another one is the Osmond Institute for Global Studies and the Core Humanities Department, which has supported quite a bit of the research I'm going to be talking about here and also the American Institute for Sri Lanka Studies. And I really wanted to thank all these groups beforehand, in part because they are letting me do something that English professors don't always get to do. And it, it raises this fundamental question, and this is the very question I got back from NSF the first time I applied for a grant for them to go do research on this. And that question is, oops, sorry, we're getting ahead of ourselves. What does an English professor have to do with elephants? Um, you know, a lot of times we think of an English professor, uh, we think of faculty working in the humanities um, as working with texts and books. Um, and when I originally applied for to the NSF to get a grant to go do research on how human elephant conflict was constructed and worked, they in essence said, you're an English professor, what do you, need to know about this? What do you have to glean from this? And it made me think a lot about what do I need to do? So I reached out to some colleagues over in Kabner and Geography, and we talked about it. And we thought that there really was an interesting space for us all to collaborate because elephants are functioning in a very specific way here. And how elephants are functioning is based off of how people are talking about this. Not just the scientists who are doing the research, but also the people who are living in the communities and the government and all of these other stakeholders are discussing it. And what do English professors look at? Well, people like me, we look at how stuff is talked about and discussed. So we thought about this some more and you know, we put it in again and they said, yes, this is something that should be studied. And there's some key terms that I think help explain how I approach elephants. So this is really, that was all kind of a preamble to this talk. And now we're gonna really dive in. The first thing that someone like me, like me brings from an English department is this idea of discourse analysis or the study of rhetoric, rhetoric or specifically for me, Topoi. So Topoi is coming from this guy, Aristotle, okay? Aristotle, a couple thousand years ago, sits under a tree and tries to imagine all the different ways humans construct arguments. What are the different ways we organize our arguments? And he labels these things topoi or topics. Some of the most common topoi that we're used to talking about is chronology. Uh, the topoi of chronology is in essence telling a story. This happened, then this happened, then this happened. Or there's also the topoi of space, right? How things are spatially oriented. I walked into the room on the left was, you know, the book on the right was the chair that's organizing things spatially using language. There's also cause and effect. This caused something to happen or definition and consequence. If this is in fact tea, is it, you know, good or not? It is good tea. But um, topo are these organizational structures that all humans use according to Aristotle. So, what I want to think about here is what topoi or what ways do people organize talking about elephants? And that's one thing I can bring in here. So with that in mind, we come up with our next big topic that we're going to be thinking about, and they're connected. That's the argument I'm going to make through you. And that is this idea that is in the title of this talk, and that is the Anthropocene. The Anthropocene is the idea that we're living in a geological time where humans are changing the environment so much that we are literally changing the bedrock that exists and is being created to such an extent that in a million years from now, or millions of years now, if there were no humans here, someone could come and sample and tell that the humans were here because of the change in the geological layers. Now, there's lots of different ways to discuss how we're changing these geological layers. Uh, one of my, the most interesting, I think, is to think about plastics and chicken. Uh, we consume much, much more chicken than we ever have in the past. And plastics are something that are ubiquitous everywhere on the planet. And even after we are long gone, traces of chicken bones and pieces of plastic will be found in the soil and the rocks left behind. But that's not always technically the way the Anthropocene is being functioning. 
The other way that I think is more interesting is to pull from the work of Lewis and Mast. Now, just to prove that I'm not all the way out here in English land talking about the humanities, I want to pull from the um, uh, journal Nature, which is one of the preeminent journals in science. Lewis and Maslin in 2015 said, are we really in the Anthropocene? What would that actually mean? How would we measure it? And they looked at a lot of different claims for what the Anthropocene is. One of the claims is, is that it was the beginning of agriculture. Another were, uh, claim was it was you know, global trade. Another one was the Industrial Revolution. Another one was nuclear weapons. And they looked through all the different ways the Anthropocene has been discussed. And they decided that actually 1610 is the most appropriate time for us to mark the beginning of the Anthropocene. That was the moment that carbon dioxide was the lowest in concentration in the atmosphere. And thereafter, carbon dioxide continues to increase steadily until this day. We, what we would talk about is climate change now, but for their purposes, this is clearly humans changing and affecting the environment in very real ways. Why do I, as an English professor or someone in the humanities, feel invited to engage in this conversation? Because uh, these authors, uh, Maslin and Lewis, recognize that this is not a simple concept. Yes, they are attempting to tie it to physical chemistry and geology, but at the same time, they recognize that there is a social human component to this. And they invite people like me to challenge them and think about what is the Anthropocene? What should be included and what shouldn't be included? What are the problems with thinking about the world in this way? And I want to come back to that. So for right now, I want to like put in a little cabinet on the side this idea of topoi, that we can organize arguments around basic structures that are ubiquitous, and the idea of the Anthropocene. And let's talk about what I hope people are really here to hear about, which is elephants. Let's see. So what I've been working on quite a bit over the last three years is elephants in Sri Lanka. So Sri Lanka is this little teardrop or sapphire shaped island just south of India in the Indian Ocean. It is actually massively important for world and global trade. Colombo is uh, one of, is the deep water port that ships move as they move from Asia across to Europe or around Africa. It was said in the 18 and 19, early 1900s that everyone important that you wanted to meet, you could meet at the hotels in Colombo if you waited long enough, because anyone that was anyone who traveled east to west, including kings and queens and business people, would stop in Colombo on their sojourn and refill the ship and hang out in Colombo for a few days. Colombo is also where a lot of pepper comes from. It's where a lot of cinnamon comes from. It's where sapphires and emeralds and rubies come from. And it's also where one of my favorite things in the world comes from, tea. If you drink Lipton or Ceylon tea, you're drinking Sri Lankan tea. So Sri Lanka is a place with massive reach throughout the entire world, uh, very important for um, transport of goods around the world. And also, you know, it's producing a lot of agricultural goods. At the same time, it has one of the largest elephant populations in Asia. It has thousands and thousands of elephants living from the plains all the way, the plains in the south, all the way across the mountains and into the north. These elephants have been there for, I mean, a very long time, play a cultural role, play an environmental role, and people come from all around the world to see them. Now, a little map to show how they're distributed here, and I'm taking this um, from Fernando's 2015 survey in comparison to his 19, the 1960s survey. We can see that elephants stretch primarily from the north, then along the eastern shoreline and wrapping around to the south. We see uh, that's the 1960s survey. In the 2015 survey, we see the area of the north is getting smaller. There are large pockets or holes in areas that before had been continuous and the area to the south is getting smaller and more scarce. What is going on here? Well, there's lots of things going on here. Between uh, independence and beginning of the 1960s, the population of Sri Lanka continues to grow and the government creates systems to relocate people to areas that have previously been uninhabited. One of those areas is near Waskamua National Forest and um, is part oops, of the um, 
is uh, Andes elephants, are, one of these areas is around the Mahoeli National Forest. Sri Lanka in the, since beginning in the 1500s changed dramatically in its ecosystem and its landmass and where there is available space. Um, in the beginning, they were producing uh, cinnamon, they were producing pepper, they were producing vanilla, um, and then they shifted to producing quinine and then later producing coffee. And then today, as I said, they're most widely known for producing tea. Large swaths of the island have been converted from the, national for the natural forests and ecosystems that had once been there into agricultural production lands. And if we think back to that map of the elephants, where the elephants are, oops, where'd my mouse go? I apologize. If we go back to this map, we can see those spaces beginning to get eat away, eaten away. One of the things that I focus most on is the Mahaweli project. So in the 1960s, due to massive uh, population pressures, um, due to massive population pressures, the, uh, the Sri Lankan government worked with the United Nations to get a grant to build irrigation dishes and tanks and waterways in an area that had for long been arid. There was rainfall there, but it wasn't predictable rainfall and not enough rainfall to really allow agriculture production. It was this massive swath of land that ran east-west across the northern part of the country. For a long time, for hundreds of years, people really hadn't lived there because there was really no way to make out a subsistence living. As the tea plantations grew, as the coffee plantations before them grew, as the cinnamon and quinine production took over, elephants slowly moved out of lower lowland areas or forested areas that were being taken over for agriculture production and moved into this band of area where humans were not living because there wasn't the opportunity to produce agriculturally. The Mahaweli project was all designed to undo this. It was designed to create catchments or what they will call tanks for water that could then be used for agriculture. By doing that, they created land that would was now open for settlement. And as population uh, pressure increased in Colombo, the government allowed people to move, gave them homestead lands and allowed them to produce agricultural rice, uh, take over fields. They even built small towns and gave people houses in this area based off of this project. Now the catch in all of this, if you haven't figured this out, is that they were moving people directly into the areas that elephants were living. The government knew that this was happening to a certain extent. So what we see here is an area that had once had nobody in it and now was beginning to have people in it because a few things were being built. On the left, we can see roads. And behind the elephants in that picture on the left, we can see the power lines that are running to a neighboring village. On the picture on the right, though it's a little bit hard to see with the reflection of the mountains, there's a massive body of water there. That's not a naturally occurring lake. That is a irrigation drainage area that has been dammed off to create a reservoir of water that would then be used for agricultural purposes. This was all being built in the exact area that the elephants had migrated to as human expansion had happened over the last few centuries. Now humans were moving directly into that space. And if we remember and think about the Anthropocene in this moment, humans are reshaping this environment in very, very real ways that will have permanent ramifications. They're literally changing the soil makeup, the type of uh, plants that are being grown there, the roadways, the uh, the rock formations, all of those things are being redesigned and redirected for human purposes. And it's coming into direct conflict with the elephants living there. When elephants and humans live in the same space, we get human elephant conflict, okay? What does human elephant conflict look like? Well, elephants are rather big. It might be, as the picture on the lower right is, an elephant is going into someone's garden and ripping out their papaya and stealing the coconuts and ripping out their cassava or manioc or other vegetables and eating them and trampling and stuff. Or the elephant might just, as the top picture shows, knock a hole in the wall of a house and then reach inside and grab a big bag of rice and walk away. Human-elephant conflict occurs any place that human and elephants live in the same 
proximity. Uh, there's a famous study of a protected forest in Thailand where there was only one elephant that lived in that forest. And in the communities surrounding that forest, there was human elephant conflict. In a very specific way, humans and elephants are actually uh, fighting after the same resources. They both want food. And humans, it happens, are really good at producing rice in this area, and that's something that's a high value food for elephants. So they're more than willing to break into someone's house. And we need to recognize that these are not uh, uh, easy to break into houses. These are brick and mortar buildings that the elephants can clearly knock down. This is a massive issue. Every year, over 200 elephants die and over 70 people are injured throughout the country of Sri Lanka uh, due to human elephant conflict. Now, this is a natural resource issue. You have two different populations living in the same area competing for the same resources, and they must be managed. While this might seem like a technical scientific question, and it is in many ways, there are lots of technical uh, things that we need to think about. From my perspective, this, that little dash there between human and elephant, that's where I work. That's where the humanities work. Because the conflict between humans and elephants is something that is both real, it is happening, but it is also something described. It is something that is felt and experienced. And there are lots of variables at play here. What got me all interested in this is working with an organization called the Sri Lanka Wildlife Conservation Society. Human elephant conflict is something you can watch TED Talks on the use of bees to stop human elephant conflict. Uh, there's lots of other people talking about human elephant conflict, but the organization that I came really intrigued with was the Sri Lanka Wildlife Conservation Society. They work in this area around the Mahawali Project outside of Waskamua National Park to try to um, mitigate human elephant conflict by helping humans and protecting elephants from these issues. They take this on from a ground up approach. Instead of coming in and saying, this is what needs to be done, they work with the communities that are being affected by human elephant conflict to try to understand the experiences that they're having and to come up with solutions. If we go back a few slides here, those elephants sitting on the road there, this was a big issue for the communities that lived on the other side of this road. And the Sri Lanka Wildlife Conservation Society recognized this. This road that the elephants are actually sitting on, as I'm looking at this photo, to the left, there is a village. About two miles to the right is the school that the children need to go into that village. Those elephants are walking through that tall grass every day as the students are walking back and forth to, uh, to school. Clearly, this is going to create a situation with conflict. Parents were beginning to walk their children, taking um, either rifles with them or uh, um, firecrackers with them to attempt to scare the elephants away, but this was becoming a massive issue. Instead of coming in from a top-down approach and explaining how we could fix this with behaviors, the Sri Lanka Wildlife Conservation Society um, went to the community and talked to them and realized that the most effective thing to do here would be to get a bus. So they got a bus that would bus the students from their community to the school every day and back through the area with the elephants. This meant that the children were protected from the elephants by the physical bus. Parents were no longer walking and shooting at elephants if they came into conflict with each other. And the elephants weren't harassed, so they were less likely to be aggressive to the people in the community more generally. This was a great solution that was being brought from the ground up. Additionally, they discovered that uh, ele Asian elephants, specifically in Sri Lanka, really don't like orange trees. They found this out by doing trial and error and working with different farmers. And then they started planting orange trees with farmers and found that elephants wouldn't bother those farming areas anymore. So this became something they did. And they worked with community members to, to uh, try to help them plant more um, orange trees to protect the situation. Now, all of this sounds well and wonderful, but you know, how are we functioning in this space becomes a big question. How, for me, as someone who, dis who studies discourse and rhetoric, I'm really interested in this basic question. How does the Sri Lanka Wildlife Conservation Society 
work with the community members and gets them to trust and value them. And then also protect the elephants in a way that someone like me who likes elephants is like, wow, you're doing a great job protecting and saving elephants. And then also working with the government to make sure that the government feels like this situation is being managed the best that it can be. They do this by recognizing the constraints on every single group. Farmers want to produce more crops, more fields, expanding the range of their agricultural production, which sometimes will bring them into conflict with the elephants. They don't want to report that they're in conflict with the elephants to the government because if they report that they're in conflict with the elephants to the government, they will have to shrink the size of their fields to try to mitigate that. The Sri Lanka Wildlife Conservation Society is able to step in and when they hear there's a problem, they work with the communities to come up with a solution, which would be mutual beneficial to both parties. For me, I wanna understand how does that happen? I also wanna understand how does the Sri Lanka Wildlife Conservation Society communicate differently to all of these different stakeholders. In theory, they're talking about human elephant conflict, but that means something different to the communities that are having their houses broken into, to the farmers, to the government agents, to the uh, people like me who are traveling there to see the elephants and care about the elephants, and to Sri Lankans more generally who care about the elephants. At the exact same time, I think it's important to recognize this. The elephants are also living within the Anthropocene if we posit that as an organizing system. It is not just that humans are changing them, it's that elephants are changing their behavior in reaction to that. So this picture was taken by me uh, in Yala National Park, which is way down in the southern corner of Sri Lanka. These elephants, Yala National Park is a massive national park, but only a small corner of it is open for tourists to go in. The rest of it is either protected or is uh, designed for experiments and studies to be run. The elephants know where humans are allowed and not to go intuitively. At the same time, the elephants recognize how roads are functioning through the space that they are moving. So the elephants actually create their own roads through the brush to avoid going through the roadways and the cars that humans are using. At the exact same time, again, the people in those cars are communicating by cell phones to tell each other where these elephants are. So elephants are living not just in the physical landscape, they are building in a physical landscape that has been rebuilt with roads. And they are building, living in a physical landscape that has been rebuilt with roads with political boundaries where people can and cannot go that the elephants begin to recognize. And on top of that, there's a cellular network and communication between people on the infrastructure that exists that the elephants are reacting to in real time. The elephants are both reacting to the Anthropocene and pushing back. This is a way of avoiding the conflict that was happening outside of Waskamua National Park that I was talking about before. But it should also be noted that in this situation, it is not just humans that are remaking the environment, it is the elephants themselves that are remaking the environment. This gets us to kind of a different position in this whole conversation. I think a lot of times people hear the Anthropocene and they see it as, um, they see the Anthropocene as a um, overall negative, that humans are ruining the planet. But I, I think we could actually view the Anthropocene as an invitation. The Anthropocene suggests that humans are changing every single aspect of the planet all the time, all at once. If that is true, that means we need to recognize that that's happening and acknowledge that we have an ethical responsibility to think about how our actions are going to change things or not change things everywhere and anywhere all at once. To put this more perfectly, I pull from William Cronin, uh, whose book, uh, Nature's Metropolis, is one that I love. I don't teach it, it's quite long, but I do love this book in part because he's from Madison, Wisconsin, like I was. And 
this whole book is about Chicago, but he begins it by talking about growing up in Wisconsin and how much he loved the forest and wilderness of the West and Wisconsin and how much he hated Chicago and these urban structures, these built environments. But through his research, he begins to recognize that all environments are built. That yes, Chicago is constructed, but that construction also then constructs the nature reserves that he enjoys in Wisconsin. Those nature reserves are preserved by choice in relationship to the city of Chicago. In the same way, when we think about Sri Lanka, those areas that are preserved for the elephants are not preserved by accident, but by choice. And we begin to structure an environment where we are automatically going to create this conflict, as I said before, but also the elephants are going to learn that structure and attempt to rebuild the environment to meet their own ends. So I want to go back to where I began. I hope this is all making some sense, and I think I can tie it together right now. There's another part of this story I haven't told you. Yes, the area around Waskamu where the elephants are having conflict didn't have people living in it for hundreds of years, but it was not always that way. Thousands of years ago, uh, different empires uh, built irrigation systems and, and the tanks and the reservoirs in the same way that were built in the 1960s to increase agriculture production in the exact same way that it was being done in the 1960s. The, uh, those empires restructured the environments, restructured the kind of things that were growing, restructured the very geography and distribution of water in the very same way that was happening in the 1960s, in the very same way that was happening with the, with the expansion of the tea plantations and cinnamon crops and quinine production in the very same way that we call now the Anthropocene, as that moment that everything is always being reshaped, it was being done 2000 years ago in Sri Lanka by these empires that were doing the exact same thing. Which begs this basic question, is 1610, this dip in carbon dioxide as uh, Lewis and Maslin point out, really the beginning of the Anthropocene? Or, have we always already been in the Anthropocene? Has the environment always been constructed by us? Because if we recognize that the elephants are reacting to our actions and that we are reacting to the elephants' actions through human-elephant conflict and coming up with ways to mitigate the situation, aren't we imbricated in the same ecosystem that we are claiming to be separate from? Aren't we part of the same actual environment uh, that we for so long have posited the city of Chicago and other places as outside of? Aren't all of these things imbricated at the same time? And if that's true, then what ethical duties do we have to recognize our relationships in those situations? If topoi are the organizing ways that we construct arguments, the Anthropocene is always going to posit humans as the center of the discussion. And if humans are always the center of discussion, we're never really going to understand the environmental implications and the environmental signaling that things like elephants, which are really good communicators, are trying to tell us. When I designed this talk, I went back and forth a whole bunch of times. On one hand, I wanted to give this basic narrative toe point, right? Just tell you my story of coming to this. On the other hand, I wanted to posit it around human development. I tried to think about how do I put elephants at the center? How do I talk about elephants living in the Anthropocene and talking back? And maybe if we were listening to them, we'd realize we've never been in the Anthropocene because we've always been living with these elephants. I mean, not me personally, but the people in Sri Lanka and those cultures in the past. This is what I'm really interested in. How do we understand that and communicate that? How do we react to these kinds of situations? And how do we resist the desire to put humans at the center of this and describe this down from a top-down scientific approach on how we should deal with these issues? Which leads me to my last slide. This is all built to a project for students because 
when I was there working with the Sri Lanka Wildlife Conservation Society, I realized I had a lot of things that I would really like to learn from them. And before I started doing English, I was actually a forester. I did um, agroforestry, I did Peace Corps, international work. I worked in the trees and natural resource management. And I realized that the way the Sri Lanka Wildlife Conservation Society was approaching these problems was different than the way I had been trained. And I think that that's something that'd be really interesting for our students to learn. I think it's also important for students to realize that if we're gonna approach a natural resource question like human elephant conflict, we can't just approach it from one specific format. It can't be a question of putting up fences because I hate to break it to you, elephants will push them over. It's rather humorous. I could tell you about it if you want. Um, elephants will break through barriers. Um, if killing them and moving the herds is problematic for lots of other issues, changing paradigms won't always, uh, changing agricultural practices won't always be practical for the humans living there. We need to come up with ways to approach these things that are interdisciplinary, where we're bringing fields of gathering data. We're working with the community to understand how they see that data. And then we're working with the tools that might be available to, with the community, understand what kind of solutions could we come up with that we might not be seeing. So we have a summer funded research project that we're inviting students to apply to. Um, if you use that QR code, it will take you to all the information there. Uh, but this is to fund nine students to go to Sri Lanka to study uh, human elephant conflict outside of Waskamo National Park. Now, um, I feel like I've babbled on long enough, but I hope that I've made the argument that the humanities has a crucial role to play in all of this. Understanding how we are viewing and discussing and arguing these issues is important for us if we are ever going to find real world applicable solutions. Um, and I thank you all for your time. Well, wonderful. Thank you so much, uh, Jason, for that rich uh, and stimulating talk. I, I really enjoyed it. Um, I probably have a couple of questions to ask you, but I do want to maybe give the, that opportunity um, to anyone who might be in the audience. So let me just reiterate um, to folks listening at home, um, if you use the Q&A uh, function, uh, which should be at the bottom of the webinar screen there, please feel free to um, type in any questions um, that you might have for Professor Ludden, um, while you're maybe mulling that over, um, I have maybe just a question that kind of popped into my head um, while you were speaking. And, and thanks so much for this great talk, by the way, uh, Jason. Um, I guess one question I had, um, I don't think you, you said the word um, poaching. Um, and that's one of the sort of the, the, the first things I think of um, if someone were to say, I'm very ignorant on this topic, but if someone were to say, you know, what, what comes to mind when you think about sort of the elephant population, certainly the African elephant population. Well, I think about poaching, I think about the ivory industry. That doesn't seem to have come up um, in your talk um, at all. I mean, sounds like the worst uh, of the conflict is that, you know, elephants will steal a little bit of rice or something like that. But can you talk a little bit about them? What is it about the Sri Lankan context in particular that, uh, well, first of all, I guess the question is, is there a poaching uh, problem? Uh, and, and if not, what is it maybe unique about the, about the Sri Lankan context that, um, that makes that the case? No, I, I think that's a really great question. Um, and uh, there's a simple answer, uh, which is, well, two simple answers that leads to a bigger answer. First thing is they, they don't have tusk or ivory that's of value. They're, they're smaller elephants. Um, if you've ever seen an African elephant, an African elephant is gigantic. It is bigger than a house. When you see one of them and you're in a car, it looks at the car and it thinks, huh. Uh, a Sri Lankan elephant is quite a bit smaller. It's maybe the size of a big SUV. It's about seven feet tall. Um, they don't like humans. Uh, they are afraid of humans, but they don't really have the ivory that those African elephants have that would be a profit. The other big thing to recognize here is that Sri Lanka had a 30 year civil war that ended a little over a decade ago. There were not a lot of guns in the country. The government doesn't want average citizens having guns. They are highly registered and highly regulated. So there's not, there's not the, uh, there are not the tools out there to go out and kill elephants. The biggest problem recently has been the accidental mating of elephants as they attempt to kill wild boar, hiding firecrackers inside something like a pumpkin where a boar would bite into it, the firecracker would go off and it would kill the 
uh, the boar, but it just maims the um, maims the elephant. Um, but I, I think that there's a bigger issue here, and you bring it up really well. Um, a lot of times when we study things like this, and this is where, again, I think the humanities can play a really critical role, we view these as ecosystems or ecologies that are technical in nature and all interconnecting can be studied in that way. But each of these systems is really the product of uh, centuries or millennia of human interactions with those environments. And understanding the human component of the ecology is just as important as understanding the ecosystem functions. Because without it, um, you might address things, you know, uh, comparably, you know, um, as, as I babble on for one more second here, you know, they used African wild beasts to become a really good um, uh, um, uh, um, the uh, uh, the African wild bees have been used to as a defense mechanism against African elephants coming into communities. Uh, that doesn't work for Sri Lankan elephants. Um, they don't, the uh, bees that live in Sri Lanka are not as aggressive. They are not as mean. The elephants are not habituated to them as uh, those violent bees. So they tried it. Uh, but it, it's something that really didn't work very well because the ecosystems are different and the, you know, uh, for lack of better phrasing, the anthropology of the elephants, that's problematic for lots of reasons, uh, <laughs> is different. That's perfect. Yeah, thank you so much for that. Um, we, we do have a question that's sort of come um, into the chat rather than the Q&A, but that's, that's all right. Um, what, what do we care where, where it comes? Um, and uh, the... the um, We've been asked here, or you're being asked to say a little bit more about, if you could, about this summer program that I think you just you just mentioned briefly. Um, but this uh, uh, this questioner says it sounds incredible. It does kind of sound incredible to just kind of head off to Sri Lanka. But can you tell tell us a little bit more about this program? Yeah, so we're running this program for three years, and this is an NSF funded program uh, where we're looking for nine students a year three students from STEM fields, and at least, th at least three students from STEM fields, at least three students from non-STEM fields, um, looking at you humanities majors and business majors and others, uh, to go to Sri Lanka in the summer for eight weeks to work with the Sri Lanka Wildlife Conservation Society and study human elephant conflict or human ecology in one shape or form or the other. Um, students selected in this program uh, will take a geography class next semester, as well as another class to prepare for their work over there. The funding covers their travel over, um, their uh, room and board while they are there the whole time. And we're going to be working really closely with students to get them to apply to faculty to get um, Nevada undergraduate research awards, so that way they can even pay themselves while they're over there doing that research. Um, the hope is that students will have their own research project, learn the methods that the Sri Lanka Wildlife Conservation Society is doing, and also learn how to work interdisciplinarily. Um, you know, uh, this is pulling from Aristotle. You could be the best bridge builder in the world, but unless you can convince the community to build the bridge, it doesn't matter. You could be the best doctor in the world, but unless you can uh, convince your patient to take the medicine, you're nothing. Um, this is a chance for humanities students to really work with science students to be like, I have a role to play in this. And science students is like, I need your help in this to solve these complex issues. That's wonderful. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, and I'll just um, maybe remind folks watching again, please do type a question into the Q&A if something is, uh, has piqued your curiosity. It can be a little question, a factual question, a big, deep conceptual question. Um, uh, whatever whatever moves you, and um, maybe I'll ask something else um, while I've got you here. Uh, and, and and it has to do with this notion, um, this concept that you talked a lot about. It was at the center of your talk of elephant human conflict. Um, and I think you said that that is sort of a that situation obtains wherever and whenever you you, you find yourself in a in a in a predicament where humans and elephants are living nearby, they're living in the same proximity. Um, so I guess it, you know, maybe it needn't be inherently conflicting. I mean, it could be perhaps like harmonious, but, but, but that term, it sounds like, um, applies to 
wherever it is that um, humans and elephants live nearby to one another. And I guess, I mean, maybe this is an unfair question because it's, it's really big, but, but I guess I want to know um, what overall, uh, in broad strokes, you see as, or you'd regard as a kind of just resolution to these um, rival conflicting demands. I mean, on the one hand, these are beautiful, majestic creatures. They have a right to live and thrive. I think most people would grant that. Um, to be the case. Uh, on the other hand, um, you know, the Sri Lankan people have, have the right to, um, to, to produce agriculture, to use their land in ways that are, um, that redound to their benefit and well-being, to their economic advantage. Um, I mean, that's, that's, that's a legitimate claim too. Um, and so I just wonder, I mean, what, what does justice look like in this predicament? I mean, is it about uh, a kind of harmonious give and take? Is it, uh, is it about maybe just establishing um, sort of national reserves, uh, wildlife areas that are sort of wholly for the elephants that can't be encroached upon? I mean, if you had to sketch what a just resolution to this inherent conflict looks like, it looks like, you know, both sides have some legitimate claims. Um, what, you know, and maybe it's an unfair question, but what, what does that generally look like to you, if you could speak to that? No, I mean, uh, uh, um, yeah, yeah, do we have another hour? No, um, I think uh, that's the perfect question because I think that's, um, those are the questions I always want to ask when I teach. And, and I, I definitely ask them as, a, as a, a scholar where the answer is actually not as interesting as the question itself, meaning that the process of trying to answer that is really the answer itself. Um, I think, there is a conversation that needs to happen. I'm coming from, you know, discourse analysis. I'm coming from communication studies um, and environmental communication. And my thing is to really recognize how do we communicate this stuff more wholly? How do we break down barriers and understand some of the misconceptions and translations that are happening that are causing this conflict to get worse, right? So I think, you know, um, yeah, it's really easy for me to sit here in Reno and be like, well, let's just move all the people out and save the elephants, right? But that's not really just to the elephants and I'm not really, or to the people and I'm not really listening to the people then. And I think, you know, it's not really just to the elephants for us to just say, well, we'll kill anything that comes in our way. I guess my best answer in all of this is better communication and an understanding. So we're actually talking about these things. This is what I'm amazed about the Sri Lanka Wildlife Conservation Society is they are the group in the middle facilitating those conversations that might not otherwise happen. Because if we don't have the conversation, it's going to result in violence and more conflict. So by creating the opportunities and bringing the stakeholders literally together by mapping the movements of the elephants in relation to the experiences of the farmers, we create an actual conversation where we might see solutions where we wouldn't otherwise. So I could imagine coming up with better practices, right? Recognizing that the, human, or the elephants use a certain corridor in August. So we won't plant in that area in August and we'll move our rotation of crops over here or something else. Um, or maybe it's subsidizing the farmers to not plant fields that have become in conflict in a way where the farmers don't have an economic pressure to continue to grow into that space. Um, I think all of those things are possibilities. And then the other thing I posit in all of this is uh, I wanna learn how this is happening um, and resist positing solutions that are based off of my view, uh, my top-down approach. And this is a hard thing to do because we get trained, go in, solve the problem. Um, and what I'm trying to do and what this project is really about is let's pull back and listen, let's pull back and watch and let's see where we can find commonalities. So for me, it's, finding those commonalities, finding the topoi overlaps or the translation moments. I, I think that kind of gets at it, but that's the question that, you know, that's the whole point of the project is it's trying to get at that kind of thing. Yeah, that's super. Thank you so much. And so we've got a couple of uh, questions that have popped into the, uh, the Q&A. One is sort of a, 
a quick kind of administrative question. One is uh, maybe a bit uh, inviting for a longer answer. So maybe I'll just kind of package them um, as, a, as a pair uh, and you can respond to both. So um, Kate Miller asks the more kind of um, administrative question, which is, um, is this summer program that you've been speaking about and that you mentioned um, earlier, is that available to students graduating in the spring of 2022? Um, and then the, uh, perhaps the sort of the longer answer uh, question um, comes from um, Kian Zoters, um, uh, apologies if I've mispronounced that. Um, but uh, this person wants to know what the Sri Lankan government's policy happens to be about the human elephant conflict. And maybe I'll just sort of add another element to that and ask, what is the sort of Sri Lankan sort of general population's view about this sort of thing? Is there a, is there like a big position um, um, sort of pro-elephant um, uh, view out there among the, among the Sri Lankan demos? Um, or is there a sort of maybe a more pro-economic view? Um, you know what's so what's the state of the of opinion um, out there um, as well? Thank you. Yeah. Um, no, uh, that's great. So for the first question is, yeah, if you're graduating in um, spring of 2022, you won't be eligible. You have to be graduating in fall of 2022 or later um, that uh, because students need to come back and present their work. Um, students who might be really interested, please come and talk to me if, if you are in that boat because we might be we've been talking about some other opportunities and things going on as well. Um, so come and talk to me and I might be able to help you out a little bit on that. Um, the other question uh, about the government is, um, uh, it's, it's complex. The Sri Lankan government pays farmers with uh, documented damage done to them from human elephant conflict, whether that's damage to their house, their fields, their bodily harm, right? But that can sometimes be difficult to prove. And sometimes the farmers don't want to, like I said, claim it because it might suggest that they shouldn't be farming in that area and they should move, which then takes away their ability to make money. So there's that aspect of it. Another thing is, and I'm trying to remember the author's name, it's on one of the books on the shelf off the top of my head. In the United States, a lot of times we look at these kind of issues and we immediately turn to the government for the solution. Uh, that's the way we, our relationship between the environment, right? If we, a problem with wolves, right? We turn to the government. What are you gonna do about the wolves? Wild horses, what are we gonna do about the wild horses? We turn to the government. In Sri Lanka, the way the bureaucracy is set up, it's not necessarily that way. It's expected that nonprofits and non-governmental agencies will fill that void between and often be the change agent to solve the issue. So communities don't necessarily turn to the government to solve the problem. They are more likely to turn to an NGO like the Sri Lanka Wildlife Conservation Society or the um, Center for Conservation Research in Sri Lanka, which works down near Yala National Park. Um, and those organizations work with the government as well and try to come up with better practices, but it, it's not this immediate turn to the government to solve the problem. Because in some very real way, the government is the one that kind of, I feel awkward saying this, created this issue. Elephants were there, there were no people there. The government built a system of aqueducts to create agriculture and then literally moved people into the space where the elephants were living. So in a very real way, the problem was created through that practice. The other thing to get, I think, at what you were talking about, David, um, is uh, we say this a lot, you know, every issue is local or every issue is national. When I talk about uh, human elephant conflict and when it's talked about in the news and the media, it is often posed as a national issue, but it's really not. Uh, someone living in Colombo has zero issue with elephants breaking into their house. Someone living in Candy has zero issue with elephants, you know, stomping on their garden. It is these small hyperlocal areas that bear the brunt of the human elephant conflict. So while it's discussed as a national issue, it's not national at all. It's all super hyperlocal. And um, because of that, the, uh, a lot of people in Sri Lanka, the elephants are revered. They're seen as a symbol of national identity and national pride. So they're protected in lots of fundamental ways. Um, whereas someone in the local community might seem ostracized because they don't have the luxury of viewing them as that. They have the pain of dealing with the destruction that they're bringing on their property. So you get this weird disconnect. Um, and from you know, a rhetoric 
it, there's a, a certain amount of incom, uh, incompatibility there with those two arguments. If something is a national symbol of national pride, it almost by definition cannot do damage to its citizens because then it should not be valued. Uh, so working that out becomes an issue as well. That's wonderful. Thanks for that answer. Um, so there aren't any other questions in the Q&A. Maybe I'll throw one more out um, at you and see if anything else uh, pops up, though I am mindful of the time as well. Um, so I guess maybe uh, one thing that we, we haven't that hasn't really come up in the uh, in the Q&A so far is this notion of the Anthropocene, which was, of course, a central um, concept in the talk. Um, and I guess, um, I guess I was a little bit unclear, and maybe this is an invitation for you to say a little bit more, is a little bit unclear about this point that you made to the effect that, well, maybe, you know, maybe something startling and new isn't breaking out on the scene. Maybe um, what we're calling the Anthropocene has sort of always been here, or at least for a super long time anyways. But I, so I understand the Anthropocene to be roughly um, sort of a kind of a, a pair uh, of, of thoughts, maybe one um, that you know, if we if we meditate on the idea of a world without us, uh, a future world that is um, without Homo sapien inhabitants, um, we've now gotten to a point. Given all that we've done, given all the digging and polluting and everything that we've done and cutting, and we've now gotten to a point where the stamp of the human will be there forever, right? Nature will never sort of. Um, repair and, and regrow in such a way so as to hide evidence that there were that we were here and we haven't been here that long. Our species is, uh, I think, I think uh, you know the, the current scientific consensus about two hundred thousand years old. That's Homo sapiens. That's not that's not a long time. Um, so I guess look, that hasn't always been the case. I mean, if we go back to the year eighteen hundred, that's not a long time ago at all. Um, that's sort of just before the industrial revolution. That wasn't the Anthropocene. I mean, I think this is the consensus, right? If humans disappeared in a puff of smoke, nature would have uh, sort of taken over in such a way so as to kind of conceal the fact that we had ever been here. So on that analysis, isn't there something new on the scene? Um, isn't it wrong to say that sort of what we're seeing now is sort of a continuation of, of maybe a phenomenon that has always already been there as you, as you sort of intimated? So, that's kind of, again, maybe an unfair question, but I'll put it to you. No, no, uh, that's a really good one. It, I, this is a really, um, I went back and forth about putting this in this talk. For me, it, it, it's a really important way of seeing the importance of this work and elephants are functioning in an important way, but, but it's also a really complex issue. That um, the issue with dealing the Anthropocene is something very contemporary, is it's built out of this very Western European idea of modernity, that we are moving forward, we have broken with tradition, in a very Baconian sense, we are remodeling the world to fit our own ends in a way that has never ever been done before, and that the things that we are doing to the planet are irreparable and will last forever. And I think the decision to say that this started in, you know, uh, 1850 or, you know, 1945 with the uh, uh, hydrogen bomb testing, right, or this point or that point, um, it really focuses on technology as the thing that is associated with the Anthropocene in some really concrete ways, that the Anthropocene could only come about with technology. And by technology, I mean European technology. And I think this ignores all the changes that might have already been there that we were never aware of from a European standpoint because they had always already been when people sh when Europeans showed up. Um, this could be, uh, you know, the burning of prairies by indigenous populations prior to the Europeans arriving in North America, uh, reshaping how forests are functioning and the soils and, you know, literally the bedrock and the river flows themselves. In Sri Lanka, this is redoing the irrigation system and changing the pollen counts and the kind of rock you're going to find in different locations. Um, in Hawaii, it's literally choosing specific plants to grow in specific places, changing aquaculture and water tables uh, through their own practices in ways that when uh, you know Captain Cook showed up in Hawaii, it was already done. He didn't understand that the 
island was functioning in ecological symbiosis with the human population. So my fear with this idea of the Anthropocene, which prioritizes the modern as the driving concept of who we are and how powerful humans have become, is it ignores all the power that had existed prior to European industrialization and expansion. It can reinforce rather quickly uh, a kind of racial mindset that Europeans are superior because they have the ability to manipulate the land in this Bacon model again uh, in a way that is much more powerful than anyone had before. But in Sri Lanka, the um, uh, well and the irrigation system that was developed there 2000 years ago wouldn't be seen until 19, uh, the 1860s in Europe. Uh, you know, the wagon and transportation systems of China from 2,500 years ago didn't exist in Norway and the Vikings until the late 1800s. Um, to say that Europe is the driving force of this change is to ignore the changes of these other uh, groups, populations, empires, and their effect on the land. And that's my fear. I think that there are arguments to be made for, well, you know, plastic is everywhere. Nuclear you know, residue can be found in truffles in Northern Scotland. Um, and that's true, but you know, maybe those truffles are there because you know, 2,000 years ago, humans decided that they would plant truffles there and, or, or those mushrooms there. And that changed the soil and the trees that could grow there in dramatic and important ways. So I, I hope that kind of gets at it. And um, I think I see the Anthropocene as something to argue against to be generative and productive. Um, I think it allows me to see sometimes what I am not seeing uh, in ways that allow me to come up with new kinds of arguments. That's terrific. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Jason. Uh, as I look at the clock, it, it looks as though we've uh, uh, run out of time. So I do want to thank you for that wonderful and stimulating uh, lecture this evening. And I do want to thank everyone um, who uh, tuned in at home as well. Um, there's going to be another talk uh, just like this one. In fact, it'll be delivered by myself uh, one week from today, same bat time and bat channel and all the rest. So um, stay tuned for that announcement as well, um, if you might be interested. Um, and uh, uh, apart from that, I'll just say thank you to everyone. Stay healthy and safe. Uh, thank you for tuning in tonight and um, good evening. Thank you.